Κυρίες και κύριοι, μπορούμε να αρχίσουμε την συνεδρία υποδοχής του κυρίου Ιραντ Μάλκιν, ομότιμου καθηγητή της Αρχαίας Ελληνικής Ιστορίας και της Μεσογειακής Ιστορίας και Πολιτισμών στο Πανεπιστήμιο του Τελαβίβ ως ξένου εταίρου της Ακαδημίας Αθηνών. Αξιότιμες κυρίες και κύριοι καθηγητές, εκλεκτή προσκεκλημένη η Ακαδημία Αθηνών κατά τη συνεδρία της Ολομελίας της 30ης Μαΐου 2019 εξέλεξε ως ξένο εταίρο της τον καθηγητή κύριο Ιραν Μάλκιν, ομότιμο καθηγητή της Αρχαίας Ελληνικής Ιστορίας και της Μεσογειακής Ιστορίας και Πολιτισμών στο Πανεπιστήμιο του Τελαβίβ, ως ξένο εταίρο της στον κλάδο των κλασικών σπουδών στην τάξη των γραμμάτων και των καλών τεχνών. Ο κύριο Μάλκιν είναι ένας από τους επιφανέστερους και κυρίω από τους πλέον πρωτότυπους ιστορικούς της Αρχαίας Ελλάδας διεθνώς. Την επιστημονική του πορεία θα παρουσιάσω ευθύς αμέσως. Ο Ιραν Μάλκιν, τον οποίο η Ακαδημία Αθηνών έχει σήμερα τη χαρά και τη τιμή να υποδέχεται στους κόλπους της ως ξένο εταίρο, είναι ένας Ιστορικού τη Αρχαία Ελλάδα διεθνώ. Ο Μάλκιν είναι ομότιμο καθηγητή Αρχαία Ελληνική Ιστορία στο Πανεπιστήμιο του Τελαβίβ, καθηγητή στην έδρα Μεσογειακή Ιστορία και Πολιτισμών στο ίδιο Πανεπιστήμιο από το 2003 και επισκέπτη καθηγητή στο Τμήμα Κλασικών Σπουδών του Πανεπιστημίου τη Οξφόρδη για το χρονικό διάστημα 17-22. Ο Ιραν Μάλκιν αναγορεύτηκε διδάκτορα Αρχαία Ιστορία στο Πανεπιστήμιο τη Πενσιλβάνια το 1982 έτος κατά το οποίο και άρχισε την ακαδημαϊκή του στάδιοδρομία στο Πανεπιστήμιο του Τελαβίβ. Πολύ σύντομα, το 1986, συνείδησε και μέχρι πρόσφατα συνεξέδιδε την Mediterranean Historical Review, επιθεώρηση διεθνούς εμβέλειας αφιερωμένη στη μελέτη της ιστορίας της Λεκάνης της Μεσογείου, τόσο της αρχαίας όσο και της σύγχρονης. Έκτοτε, ο Μάλκιν έχει αναλάβει κέρυες διδακτικές, ερευνητικές και διοικητικές θέσεις στο Ισραήλ και διεθνώ. Έχει διδάξει σε πλήθος ακαδημαϊκών ιδρυμάτων της Αλοδαπής. Ενδεικτικά μνημονεύουμε ότι υπήρξε 7 φορές Directeur d'Etudes ή Professeur Invité στην École Pratique des Autres Etudes και την École Normale Supérieure των Παρουσίων, προσκεκλημένος επιφανών καθηγητών όπως του Maurice Eymar, του Marcel Detien, του François Lissaraga, του Pierre Vidal Naquet, Μάμπρε βιβλιτέ στο Ινστιτούτο Universitaire de France, επισκέπτη καθηγητή στο Πανεπιστήμιο Τζον Χόπκιν τη Βαλτιμόρη, το Πανεπιστήμιο τη Καλιφόρνια στο Μπέρκλεϊ, το Πανεπιστήμιο του Μόντρεαλ και ούτω καθεξή. Υπήρξε επίση επιτριετία πρόεδρο τη Επιτροπή Απονομή του Υψηλότατου Κύρου Dan David Price. Σε αναγνώριση του επιστημονικού του έργου, το 2014 του απονομήθηκε το βραβείο Ιστορία του Ισραήλ. Το επιστημονικό έργο του Ιραν Μάλκιν είναι εντυπωσιακό σε ποσότητα και ποιότητα, ενώ έχει αποδειχθεί κομβική σημασία για την προώθηση και την ανανέωση τη έρευνα σε διάφορου κλάδου τη αρχαία ιστορία, τη αρχαιολογία, τη ανθρωπολογία και τη εθνολογία. Περιλαμβάνει 13 μονογραφίε και επιμέλειε συλλογικών τόμων, 65 άρθρα και πλήθο βιβλιοκρισιών και λιμάτων σε εγκυκλοπαίδειε. Το έργο του Μάλκιν επικεντρώνεται στην πλουσιότατη ιστορία και την ιστοριογραφία της αρχαίας Μεσογείου, με ειδική αναφορά σε δύο αλληλένδετες περιοχές έρευνας, το θέμα της ελληνικής εθνικής ταυτότητας και του απικισμού, την αρχαία θρησκεία και τον μύθο, πρωτίστως ως εργαλεία πολιτικά, δηλαδή τους τρόπους με τους οποίους η λατρεία και ο μύθος συχνά αξιοποιούνταν ως εκφράσεις τόσο μιας συλλογικής ιστορικής ταυτότητας, όσο και ελληνικών στάσεων απέναντι σε ξένα εδάφη και περιοχές, το πώς ο μύθος δικαιολογούσε και νόμιμοποιούσε την εγκατάκτηση εδαφών, τον εκτοπισμό των ντόπιων πληθυσμών και τον απικισμό. Η αξία της ενδελεχούς ανάλυσης πολιτικής αυτής πτυχής της θρησκείας, λατρείας και του μύθου δεν περιορίζεται στην κατανόηση του αρχαίου κόσμου, αλλά επεκτείνεται στο πάντα επίκαιρο και φλέγον ερώτημα του πώς διάφοροι λαοί κάθε εποχής δικαιολογούν ή αποπειρώνται να δικαιολογήσουν τις εθνικές και εδαφικές χωρικές τους ταυτότητες. Η κατεξοχήν πρωτοποριακή συνεισφορά του Μάλκιν έγκυται στην εφαρμογή της θεωρίας των δικτύων, όπως πρωτίστως εφαρμόζεται στις φυσικές και τις κοινωνιολογικές επιστήμες, στο πεδίο των ανθρωπιστικών επιστήμων και ειδικότερα στο πεδίο της αρχαίας ιστορίας. Στο πεδίο της ιστορίας, η θεωρία των δικτύων 
προσφέρει μια καινούρια οπτική της γεωγραφίας του ανθρώπινου χώρου και των ανθρώπινων αλληλεπιδράσεων, οπτική που έρχεται να αντικαταστήσει την παραδοσιακή αντίληψη περί εδραιωμένων ιεραρχικών σχέσεων η αυστηρής διχοτόμησης κέντρου και περιφέρειας. Επιπλέον, όπως συστηματικά δείχνει το έργο του Μάλκιν, η αξία της θεωρίας των δικτύων δεν περιορίζεται στην κατανόηση του ελληνικού πολιτισμού, είναι εξίσου πολύτιμη και για την κατανόηση άλλων πολύ διαφορετικών φαινομενικά πολιτισμών συμπεριλαμβανομένου του σύγχρονου κόσμου μας. Ενδεικτικά θα αναφερθούμε σε τέσσερα από τα πλέον επιδραστικά βιβλία του Ιραντ Μάλκιν. Στο παρθενικό βιβλίο του «Religion and Colonization in Ancient Greece» στο Leiden Brief 1987, που έχει ως βάση τη διδακτορική του διατριβή, ο Μάλκιν συνεξετάζει ποικίλε θρησκευτικέ πτυχές του ελληνικού απεικισμού μέσω της σύνθεσης εντυπωσιακού αριθμού λογοτεχνικών και κυρίως αρχαιολογικών τεκμηρίων. Βασική αρετή του βιβλίου είναι ότι επιχειρεί μια συνδυαστική και δυναμική θεώρηση θρησκευτικών πτυχών που κατά κανόνα εξετάζονται μεμονωμένα, όπως το ρόλο της προφητείας και της ίδρυσης μαντίων, το έθιμα της μεταφοράς της ιερής φλόγας από τη δημόσια αιστεία της Μητρόπολης στην Απικία, την ίδρυση τεμενών. Ακριβώ χάρη σε αυτή τη συγκεντρωτική επισκόπηση, το βιβλίο αποδεικνύεται κατεξοχήν διαφωτιστικό για ένα ζήτημα ευρύτερο, όσο και επίκαιρο. Του τρόπου δηλαδή με του οποίου η θρησκεία, στο συνολό τη, βοηθά του λαού να διαμορφώσουν την ταυτότητά του όταν ξεκινούν τη ζωή του σε μια νέα γη. Αναφορικά με τι συγκεκριμένε θρησκευτικέ διαστάσει του ελληνικού απεικισμού που εξετάζονται, αξίζει να σημειωθεί ενδεικτικά μια μόνο αξιοσημείωτα πρωτότυπη διαπίστωση. Σε αρκετέ περιπτώσει, οι απεικιστέ επέλεγαν το σημείο ίδρυση των τεμενών του με πλήρω ορθολογικά κριτήρια σχεδιασμού και χωροταξία και όχι βάσει τη υποτιθέμενη εγγενού ιερότητα αυτών των σημείων. Βαρύνουσα σημασία δίνεται επίση τον ρόλο τη ηρωολατρεία στη διαμόρφωση τη νέα διακριτή ταυτότητα τη απικία, κατά τη διαδικασία κατά την οποία η απικία μεταβαίνει από την αναπαραγωγή των χαρακτηριστικών και των πρακτικών της Μητρόπολης στη διαμόρφωση του νέου στάτους τους. Ενώ δηλαδή οι πρώτες λατρείες της φαίνεται ότι ήταν κοινέ με αυτές τις Μητρόπολης, ο θάνατος του ιδρυτή της Απικίας μεταβάλλει τα δεδομένα και εγκαινιάζει μια νέα κατάσταση και εποχή. Ο Μάλκιν μάλιστα πιθανολογεί ότι αυτή η αντίληψη για τον καταλυτικό ρόλο της ηρωολατρίας απέκτησε τόσο ισχύ και διάδοση ώστε να υιοθέτησαν και πόλεις της ίδιας της Ελλάδας που είχαν ιδρυθεί προγενέστερα. Έτσι η λατρεία του ιδρυτή σε αυτές τις ελληνικές πόλεις έχει, τουλάχιστον εν μέρη, ως πρότυπο το φαινόμενο της απικίας. Το φαινόμενο και οι μηχανισμοί του απικισμού υπό το πρίσμα των μύθων και της λατρείας αυτή τη φορά σε σχέση με τον κόσμο της αρχαίας Σπάρτης και των απικιών τη είναι το αντικείμενο του βιβλίου του Μάλκιν «Myth and Territory in the Spartan Mediterranean» CUP 1994. Το βιβλίο επανεκδόθηκε το 2002 και το 2003, ενώ έχει μεταφραστεί στα γαλλικά ως «La Mediterrane Spartiate, Myth et Territoire» 1999, δεύτερη έκδοση το 4. Πρόκειται για μια τεκμηριωμένη απόπειρα επαναπροσδιορισμού της ταυτότητας της αυτοικόνας και ιδίω της επιρροής της αρχαίας Σπάρτης, ανασκευάζοντας εν πολύ τη διαδεδομένη ιδίω στη σύγχρονη κριτική εικόνα της Σπάρτης ως μιας περίκλειστης, εσωστρεφούς και ξενοφοβικής κοινωνίας, η οποία αποτασσόταν το εμπόριο, το χρήμα και τις θαλάσσιες επικοινωνίες, ο Μάλκιν φέρνει στο φως και στοιχειοθετεί πιστικά τη σημαντική επιρροή των λακεδαιμονίων κατά την αρχαϊκή εποχή. Η επιρροή αυτή επεκτηνόταν σε ολόκληρο το εύρος της Μεσογείου, όπως διαφαίνεται και από τον φαινομενικά παράδοξο ενιολογικό όρο «Σπαρτιατική Μεσόγειος» «Spartan Mediterranean» του τίτλου του βιβλίου. Η επιρροή των λακεδαιμονίων απορρέει από τις πολυάριθμες απικίες που η Σπάρτη ίδρυσε εκείνη την περίοδο, ενώ πολύ σημαντικός προς την, αυτή την κατεύθυνση αποδεικνύεται και ο ιστορικοπολιτικός ρόλος του μύθου. Πράγματι, ένας από τους κύριους μηχανισμούς που επέτρεπε στις ελληνικές πόλεις να προβάλλουν επεκτατικές αξιώσεις και δικαιώματα κατάκτησης εδαφών ήταν η δημιουργία καταστατικών μύθων, charter myths, μύθων που ερμήνευαν και εξηγούσαν ανώμαλα ή έστω καινοφενή χαρακτηριστικά και πρακτικές του παρόντος μέσω της αναγωγής τους σε ένα επινοημένο παρελθόν. Η Σπάρτη ειδικότερα ήταν κατεξοχήν συνειφασμένη με ένα εκτενές δίκτυο ιδρυτικών καταστατικών μύθων και μύθων νομιμοποίησης. 
Τέτοιοι μύθοι τη Σπάρτη περιλαμβάνουν πρωτίστω τον μύθο τη επιστροφή των Ηρακλειδών, αλλά και την επίσκεψη του Μενέλαου στη Λιβύη κατά την Ομυρική Οδύσσια και την ίδρυση τη Κυρίνη. Ο ρόλο του μύθου στη συγκρότηση και την κατανόηση τη ταυτότητα είναι το αντικείμενο τη κλασική μελέτη του Μάλκιν, The Returns of Odysseus, Colonization and Ethnicity, University of California Press 98, η οποία έχει μεταφραστεί στα Ιταλικά και τα Εβραϊκά. Το βιβλίο χαρακτηρίστηκε essential reading για ομοιριστέ ιστορικού τη αρχαϊκή εποχή και μελετητέ τη αρχαία εθνολογία. Με το χαρακτηριστικά πυκνό και ευθύβολο ύφο του, ο Μάλκιν διερευνά τον ρόλο του μύθου στην ίδρυση και την εθνική ταυτότητα των απικιών στη βορειοειδυτική Ελλάδα και την Ιταλία, καθώ και στη διαμόρφωση των σχέσεων αυτών των απικιών με τον ελληνικό κόσμο. Ο μύθο αφενό αξιοποιήθηκε προκειμένου να διαμορφωθεί η έννοια τη εθνική ταυτότητα, ενώ έπαιζε κέριο διαμεσολαβητικό ρόλο στι σχέσει μεταξύ διαφορετικών ομάδων. Ειδικότερα, οι μύθοι επιστροφή των αρχαιών ηρώων που πολέμησαν στην Τρία, οι Νόστοι, απέβησαν καθοριστικοί για τη διήλυση και την αποκριστάλλωση των δικτών ταυτότητα όχι μόνο των Ελλήνων, πρωτοαπίκων, αλλά και των ντόπιων πληθυσμών. Σε αυτή τη διαδικασία, η Οδύσσια του Ομήρου έπαιξε ρόλο αποφασιστικό. Ο ομυρικό μύθο προσέφερε σε μη ελληνικέ εθνοτικέ ομάδε ένα ιστορικό παρελθόν, το οποίο λειτουργήσε ω καταλητικό μέσο συγκρότηση τη εθνική του ταυτότητα, αλλά και ω καταλητικό μέσο σύνδεση αυτών των ομάδων με τον ελληνικό πολιτισμό. Με λίγα λόγια, όπω εύγλωτα συμπεραίνει ο Μάλκιν, όλη η εθνογραφία τη Μεσογείου μπορεί να θεωρηθεί ότι έχει τι απαρχέ τη στη μεγάλη έκρηξη, το Big Bang, του Τροϊκού Πολέμου και την κατοπινή διάχυση, εξάπλωση. Μέσω των νόστων. Κατεξοχήν και νοτόμο για την ερμηνεία τη ιστορία εν γέννη είναι το έργο του Μάλκιν A Small Greek World Networks in the Ancient Mediterranean, Oxford University Press το 2011, δεύτερη έκδοση το 2013, το οποίο εγκαινίασε τη σειρά του Πανεπιστημίου τη Οξφόρδη Greeks Overseas, ενώ έχει μεταφραστεί στα γαλλικά το 2018. Το βιβλίο χαιρετίστηκε ομόθυμα ως μίζων συμβολή που θα προσφέρει το απαραίτητο ενιολογικό πλωστάσιο για μελέτες σε όλους τους τομείς της αρχαίας ελληνικής ιστορίας, γλώσσας και πολιτισμού. Ο Μάλκιν εξετάζει το φαινόμενο του ελληνικού απικισμού από την οπτική της ιστορίας των δικτύων, εφαρμόζοντας τα μοντέλα του μικροκόσμου δικτύων των φυσικών επιστημόνων Duncan Watts και Steven Strogatz, καθώς και τον Albert Laszlo Barbazzi και Reka Albert. Το συμπέρασμα είναι ότι ο ελληνικός πολιτισμός συγκροτούσε περισσότερο έναν αποκεντρωμένο κόσμο που προέκυψε από τα χαρακτηριστικά του δικτύου. Ο ελληνικός ιστός το Greek Wide Web, που συγκροτούσαν οι αναρρύθμιστες ιστορικές σχέσεις μεταξύ λαών, τόπων και πολιτιστικών πρακτικών στη Μεσόγειο και τον Εύξηνο Πόντο της αρχαϊκής εποχής, προσομοιάζει σε ένα σύνολο κόμβων και συνδέσεων, στο πλαίσιο του οποίου οι υπερσυνδέσεις συνέτειναν στη γέννηση του ελληνικού πολιτισμού. Ο ελληνικό πολιτισμό και η ελληνική ταυτότητα, δηλαδή, αποκρισταλώθηκαν όχι όταν οι Έλληνε ζούσαν σε γυτνίαση, αλλά άπαξ και άρχισαν να διασκορπίζονται κατά την αρχαϊκή περίοδο, όταν οι Έλληνε ίδρυαν παράλληλε πόλει κράτη και εμπορικού σταθμού από την Ουκρανία μέχρι την Ισπανία. Στη διαδικασία διαμόρφωση του ελληνικού πολιτισμού και τη ελληνική ταυτότητα, δεν έπαιζε ουσιαστικό ρόλο ούτε μια υποτιθέμενη αντίθεση μεταξύ κέντρου και περιφέρεια, ούτε μια υποτιθέμενη σαφή αντίθεση Ελλήνων και Βαρβάρων, όπω συνήθω πιστεύετε. Οι ελληνικέ απικίε προέκυψαν από πολλέ διαφορετικέ ελληνικέ μητροπόλει και δεν υπήρχε ένα και μοναδικό κέντρο που ήλεγχε και κατήφθηνε την εξάπλωση και τη διάχυσή του. Παραδειγματικέ περιπτώσει που υποστηρίζουν μια τέτοια θέση είναι η Ρόδο, η Σικελία και οι Φίνικε. Η δυναμική των δικτύων ενό μικρού κόσμου ήταν αυτό ακριβώ που επέτρεψε να διασπείρονται και να πολλαπλασιάζονται οι ροέ πολιτισμικού περιεχομένου και οι διαδικασίε αυτοεπίγνωση και ταυτότητα ανάμεσα στι απομακρυσμένε ελληνικέ κοινότητε, καθώ διευκόλυνε τη γρήγορη δημιουργία συνδέσεων. Κατά αυτόν τον τρόπο και παρόλη τη γεωγραφική του απόσταση, οι ελληνικέ κοινότητε κατέληξαν να μοιάζουν μεταξύ του πολύ περισσότερο από όσο με του κατά περίπτωση φυσικού γείτονέ του, όπω του Ετρούσκου, του Ήβηρε, του Σκύθε ή του Λίβιου. Συμπερασματικά, ο καθηγητή Ιραντ Μάλκιν αποτελεί σήμερα έναν από του επιφανέστερου μελετητέ τη αρχαία ιστορία και για τον λόγο αυτόν η υποδοχή του στην Ακαδημία μα αποτελεί ιδιαίτερη τιμή. Ευχαριστώ.
Κύριε συνάδελφε, σας καλώ τώρα για να σας περιβάλλω με το διάσημο της Ακαδημίας Αθηνών. I'm thrilled and excited and feel honored and even humbled being accepted to this august institution and I thank you so much. Can I have the water? <laughs> and I thank you so much for accepting me as a foreign member of the Athens Academy. Throughout my career as an historian, I was never an historian of Athens, as I'm sorry to say, so many of my colleagues are. Sorry, not because Athens not, doesn't merit it, but because we need a wide-angle vision when we observe the Greek world. We need a wide-angle vision to... If you look at this Greek world, formed between the river Fasis and the eastern Black Sea, all the way to Marseille in southern France, the mouth of the river Don, Panais, all the way down to Libya and Cyrene. And you understand within this period, about 200 years in the archaic period, uh, almost uh, 30 to 40 percent of all Greek city-states, there were about over a thousand of them, were created in a very dynamic process of Greek colonization. What I try to understand in the books just mentioned is how and why exactly at the time, those crucial 200 years when Greeks were basically separating and getting as far from each other as possible, that was precisely the time that their civilization converged into what we know as Hellenic civilization. Like there's a central paradox, perhaps, and very often late 19th century German scholarship was complementary of the Greeks for, well, for in spite of the distance, in spite of fragmentation, they managed to hold it together. But no, I thought it was exactly the reverse. It was because of the distance, because of the separation, because of network dynamics that Greek civilization could be formed the way it did. And one of the things that interests me most are not so much the unity of the Greek world, because I don't think there's been a unity, but the list of commonalities, the common traits, the salient features that are common to most Greek city-states. And so one of my, the things I try to do is also to identify common institutions <coughs> that form, <coughs> sorry, those commonalities. And Recently, recently is the past six years, I've been dedicated my time to an institution that was somehow under the radar of modern scholarship. That of the drawing of lots. Because ancient Greeks were drawing lots in an astonishingly wide spectrum of practices and conventions. The drawing of lots reflected the values, the practices, and the egalitarian mindset that were prevalent for nearly three centuries before the famous appearance of the lot to, um, in the Athenian democracy. The lots were used to guarantee equality, to guarantee fairness, and to prevent corruption and undue influence. Greeks often turned to random choices by drawing lots. Without the wide-ranging use of lotteries in archaic period, classical democracies, I think, would never have seen the light of day the way it did, namely by a huge mixture lottery of the Athenian population, the Attic population, to form a new citizen body. 
Perhaps modern democracies should be interested in the so-called legacy of Greece that sometimes is just a coin uh, of a word, but basically the drawing of lots. Athenian democracy is often represented as the salient feature of the legacy of ancient Greece, but somehow modern democracy didn't take its salient feature, namely the drawing of lots, and chose representation instead. And we should remember the representation in modern democracies basically keeps the top bottom vision of authority. Representatives are elected, sure. Power is from the people, not by the grace of God. However, the direction of rule is constantly top bottom. We elect representatives. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, the American president, uh, was considering, uh, not him, but some of his colleagues, to use the lot in the American Congress. He said, no, no, no. We should vote for the aristoi. He uses the Greek word for the best and most virtuous men to lead us as representatives. And modern democracies never, never imagined the, 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 the illnesses that we have today. Um, they, the, you, you see it all around us. There's a distaste for, polit distaste for politics, ignorance, populism, and the ever-present danger of lobbies and undue influence, something that the drawing of lots can cut right through. By contrast, when Greeks were drawing lots, the assumption was everyone is interchangeable with everybody else. Think of the selection of juries, for example, at Athens. By the interchangeability of human beings, that implies equality, because one interchangeable with the next, so they must be equal. So I devoted the past five years, six years actually, and came up with the following categories that you see before you. The distributive lotteries that define the contours of the relevant group for com or the community, which, also, which is also sovereign to decide about the action of the drawing of lots. They express a horizontal, that's a key word in my work, a horizontal vision of society, the reverse of the vertical to top bottom type of rule of authority. Distributive lotteries were employed to distribute inheritance, portions of sacrificial meat, colonial lands, booty, catch, and positions in the state. Even the entire cosmos and the provinces of the gods, notably Zeus, Hades, and Poseidon, were believed to have been distributed by lots by and among the Greek gods. Now, selective lotteries, too, implies the contours of the group when uh, picking soldiers for military duty or guard duty, picking colonists to set out and to colonize overseas, warriors for special tasks, and at some point even sorting out who were to be worshipped as the ancestral tribal heroes at Athens. Procedural lotteries were especially uh, useful for rotation and turns, I'm sorry it doesn't cover everything here, such as guard shifts again, stations on a race course, allocation of court cases, and rotating days of the presidency of the Athenian boule in the fourth century. In the fifth century, even earlier, even entire theaters of war could be assigned to generals by lot. Mixture lotteries were used to uh, homogenize as it were, the mother cities at the time of the foundation of new colonies. Think of the story of Thera when a lottery took place from every household, oikos, with two sons, who stays and who goes to settle in North Africa. So to homogenize the mother city at the time of foundation of new colonies and to do the same in colonies, mixing the nucleus of settlers from a specific mother city with a multitude of other Greeks uh, hobu lomenos is often the expression, who joined the foundation. To mix the people, to avoid dissension, civil strife, and to reshuffle the deck of Athenian citizens to create the basis of Athenian democracy. Divination by lot, or lot oracles, that was a discrete category for divining the intention of the gods for ad hoc issues, especially popular at the oracles of Delphi and Dodona. Now, the drawing of lots drew a line around the community. It defined communities and groups in terms of access, implying members only. The history of the lot, therefore, is one of a community that recognizes itself as a community, not necessarily a political one, making sovereign decisions about and for itself with no recourse to external authority. 
The group, well, the group might be tiny, just two brothers sharing an inheritance, or the group might, might be as large as the entire police, drawing lots for uh, settlers in a new colony. And basically also citizens sharing political rights perceived as individual equal portions. With each participant considered equal, equivalent, and interchangeable before the chance, therefore again recognized as an individual's. <clears throat> now the lottery implies equality when, before the actual drawing of lots, but what happens afterwards? Here, strangely enough, Greeks tried for, that the outcomes should be equal as well. For example, cleroi in, co in colonies were often equal in size, but unequal in terms of location or quality of soil or, or whatever have you. So the notion of uh, distribution is important. The history of the lot is the history of how people distribute things, how they regard, how they select individuals, how they take turns, how they inherit, how they mix to form a cohesive community or sometimes avoid civil strife. It is also the history of the ideas of equality and fairness or rather fairness as, call, as close as possible to equality. It's a story of the horizontal community. Like everybody else, Greeks knew elites and top bottom rule, but unlike most societies throughout history, the idea of a horizontal society was never out of the frame of reference. It is as if there was a constant tension between the vertical elite vector and the horizontal egalitarian one. This is often the case in Greek colonies where by the end of the second generation, material differences begin to matter, and you have an elite, and very often the solution to no, new ten tensions was to send out simply another colony. Greek colonies knew this egalitarian vector versus the elite vector. Now, before the lots became political, lotteries were already ubiquitous as an institution during centuries before Claestinus had arranged for the new uh, uh, mixing of the population and giving equality to citizens in a new way that was known as isonomia. They touched upon a whole spectrum of life and death, both private and public. They expressed values of individuality, fairness, and equality. Now, the notion of portion is very significant. I'm talking about Moira, but not in a metaphoric sense of faith, but in a literal sense of simply portion and this overlap between an individual and the portion is the running theme in the drawing of lots. So in the fifth century, by the time of the well-known Athenian democracy, somehow, if you wish to understand it that way, the whole state is perceived as a whole within which each person has a share, met echein tespoleos, sharing in the city. And the sharing, labeled isonomia, if nemein is indeed the key word here, namely to distribute, assign, and so forth, and so on. And so, basically, um, these are the categories um, that we will find in the book. But before that, let me just mention that, um, as you see here, the point is the idea of distribution. Drawing of lots was not a value as such, but a device, a device mostly for collective, equal, or equitable distribution. Think of Odysseus distributing goats, nine goats per ship to his companions, but nine goats per ship, why by lot? Because some goats are fat, some are skinny, some are delicious, some are horrible. So the whole thing gets mixed together. Um, it is not relevant. The drawing of lots is not relevant. When sums are equal, think of the annual distribution of the gold uh, in Sifnos to the citizens, or the Athenian notion of distributing 10 drachmas per citizen. You don't need to draw lots here because 10 drachmas, 10 drachmas always. But mostly when you distribute things that don't have a precise equal value. This is the plan, more or less, of the research, or my part of the research that I conducted. My partner, Josine Bloch, did a chapter on governance in, uh, uh, with the drawing of lots. So here you have the following. In the first part, um, I discussed the lottery mindset, religion and societies, the world of the Homeric epics, the question, when does the lot reflect the will of the gods? 
Lot's oracles, divination, and the notion of Moira, sacrifice and feast, social values and the distribution of meat by Lot. The second part deals more with land, but not just land, uh, equal and fair inheritance, colonization and mixture, partible inheritance by Lot, drawing Lot from the Athenian stage, analysis of plays, notably the Seven Against Thebes, uh, founding cities and sharing in the police, equality, allotment and civic mixture, Part three is one chapter, the lot in governance, and an appendix about the vocabulary of the lot. It is curious, uh, I thought, that there was so little study of the lot, perhaps because somehow it didn't work well with the idea of Greek rationality, La Cité des Raisons of Jean-Pierre Vernon, with, without taking into consideration that drawing lots is a rational device. Greeks made a rational decision to use random devices to get at some uh, results for so many aspects of their lives. Now, religion has been treated as an answer instead of a question. Why did the Greeks draw lots? Because they, well, they wanted to know the will of the gods, and you find us in the end of 19th century, early 20th century literature, and then silence supreme. Nobody's touching the subject anymore, or hardly at all. Um, but I don't know of any oracle that commanded Greeks to draw lots. It was usually the decision by the human uh, community itself. So the purpose of the lottery was not really to reveal the will of the gods. It was more uh, to make the sovereign decisions uh, themselves. Because generally, we should remember, this is not a secular society, right? The gods are everywhere, always. That's the initial assumption, but we should understand it as a spectrum where on the one hand you have the explicit question addressed to the gods by drawing of lots, there are lot oracles, and on the other the gods are, they preside, they don't decide, they're simply there, they're present all the time. Think of the opening of Athenian dec decrees, Theoi edoxeto demo, namely the people are deciding, Theoi is a general invocation uh, for the gods. So we're talking, the, the last book on the subject was really by Hedlam, Elections by Lot at Athens, 1891. Notice, at Athens, by Lot, a political question, and the book was, the first edition was written before the discovery of the Athenian Politeia. So this is not quite up to date, I have to say. And uh, it, it's a very good book, by the way, and he had wonderful insights uh, before that. A key term here is mindset, because the drawing of lots reflects some kind of a mindset, and I'd like to offer the following definition. A collective mindset is a common mental frame of reference that endures through time and is expressed when reacting to similar contexts and issues. It may be self-aware or not, and can be expressed in language, values, myths, collective representation, and implementation in practice. Well, a mindset is tantamount to that is how we do things, based on values, customs, and traditions that form a world view. So let us start, as the Greeks would say, with the gods. When they, the gods drew lots, for example, Hades, Zeus, and Poseidon drew lots to distribute the timai among themselves, were they doing that in order to divine the will of the gods? Obviously not. So even the mental framework of the Greeks expressing that um, well, you should remember, of course, Greeks never had a transcendent god for whom the world was an object. Those three Olympian gods won their place through violent revolution. They are distributing the spoils of war, which overlaps with their inheritance as sons of Kronos, and uh, there is, they are the sovereign group. Zeus, of course, was the king of the gods, no doubt about that, a position to which he was not chosen by lot, but to which he was elected, at least Hesiod says that. So. Uh, tell how at first the gods and earth came to be, sings Hesiod in Theogony, and how the gods divided, dasanto, their wealth among themselves, and how they share their honors, timai, amongst them, hos timas di elonto. Note the verb dateomai, which, as Martin West uh, comments, is usually in the middle voice, in the plural, and reflects a group dividing for itself, not top-bottom, of course. The myth about the division and distribution of the timai uh, encapsulates the vocabulary, practice, purpose, and values of human lotteries that will prove consistent and frequent throughout the archaic and classical 
Greek history. It also expresses notions of egalitarianism and their tension with authority. Poseidon claims that his status is equal. Let's recall the first, those famous passages. No, no, great though he is, this that he has said is too much. If he will force me against my, wi my will, me, who am his equal in rank, Motimon, since we are three brothers, all was divided amongst us. Again, you see, the Theomai, three ways, and each given his domain, Hecastos de Emoretimes. I, when the lots were shaken, the verb is palo, drew, lanchano, the gray sea to live in forever. Hades drew the lot of the mists and the darkness, and Zeus was allotted the white sky and the cloud and bright air. But earth and high Olympus are common to all three. Therefore, I am in no part of mind of Zeus. Let him in tranquility and powerful as he is stay satisfied with his third share, Moira, again. Uh, but this thing comes as a bitter sour to my heart and spirit when Zeus tries in words of anger to reprimand one who is equal in station, Isomoron, and endowed with destiny, Isa, like his. Okay? So, it is with lot oracles that we find um, the explicit asking uh, as in terms of divination. And the Delphi is interesting in that respect because uh, the Pythia herself apparently drew lots. Uh, the verb anhairein, which literally means to pick up, but also comes to mean simply to prophesy. What is she picking up? Uh, and, and there's one position thinks that Temis in the form of the Pythia here is looking in a fiale in order to pick lots from it. But the story of Delphi itself in the humanities of Aeschylus, Delphi moves from one god to another by lot until finally Apollo gets it as a gift from Phoebe. Now, the personnel of Delphi to run the oracle were often chosen by lot, and the, the station, the, the, the queue to, to address the Pythia was also determined by lot. And of course, there was the other oracle, the oracle of the two beans uh, that existed in Delphi. There's even an inscription uh, concerning Skiatoth concerning that. So you see, the spectrum is wide. If we go back to Homer and think about the division of booty, you see that it is done, the basic scheme is that uh, things will be brought to the middle and everybody gets a share. And this is the famous protest by Achilles. He thinks it's unjust. I shed my blood, but somebody who just sits around gets the same thing. Stay at home or fight your hardest, your share will be the same. Coward and hero are given equal honor. Well, he may protest, but he protests against what is the, the poet is portraying as the reality. Uh, or think of Odysseus coming back with a flock of goats from the Cyclop. He's distributing to everyone those who share the dangers of the cannibal and those who are simply sunbathing on the beach waiting for him. Everybody gets a share. Everybody is interchangeable. Everybody is there together. Things are brought usually. This is the great contribution of uh, Detienne, especially, and some others. Esto meson, to the middle, whence they are distributed yet again outside. Homeric heroes have private wealth, captured booty, enara. Aside from that, they share in the lottery of, with everyone else. This is the use of the lot and the idea of the middle seem to be joined in early Greek thought and practice. Theognis, or the poet uh, known as such, connects the social order with allotment. The poet employs the metaphor of the ship of state and complains that they seize possessions by force and discipline, or cosmos, is lost. No longer is there an equal distribution in the common interest. Well, that's the English translation, but literally, when the sharing out, the dasmos is still brought to the middle, estomeson, to be shared out equally, isos, highly significant. One of the things to do, of course, is to work with the ancient Greek language and to examine the vocabulary of uh, the drawing of lots. So uh, soon to be, there'll be an internet site that analyzes that uh, vocabulary. And the, the idea is to understand individual words in conjunction with each other and the context of their semantic fields. The pioneer was uh, 
Borecki, a Marxist historian, because of his terminology is often not read in the Anglophone world. He worked in Czechoslovakia later on. Survivals, the cumbersome title, right? of some tribal ideas in classical Greek, the use and the meaning of lanchano, the teomai, and the origin of ison echein, ison nemein, and related idioms. Tribal ideas? No, 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 that's not in our lexicon, is it? So Paul Cartridge, for example, thinks it's nonsense. Um, sorry, it's a very good book. Pioneering, it doesn't have a lot of the words, it doesn't have epigraphy, but it's a very significant work. So. What we did is to, to uh, under the research uh, money of the Israel Science Foundation, um, we collected uh, the following lemmas. There are more, of course, but that's uh, the limit of what we could do. And uh, we sort of, this is just to illustrate to you the results. On the left-hand side, you see kleros meaning distribution uh, in the whole corpus of Greek, Greek literature, excluding oratory. On the right-hand side, you find oratory, but not legal cases because there are the kleros has a very specific uh, uh, sense uh, there. And uh, most significantly, the verb lanchano, which can mean in classical Greek to get, but can also mean to get by lot. 73% uh, of all cases before the end of the fourth century mean to get by lot. This is one of the significant findings of that research, and I will not be able to analyze that table now. One way to understand the presence of the drawing of lots in, among Greeks is to see how frequent was the drawing of the lots. And sacrifice and the division of meat uh, are far more common than the distribution of booty. And of course, when you see that being practiced again and again with the same principles of the notion of distribution of booty, land, and catch, With sacrifice, the priest usually gets a geras, just like with Homeric booty, the leader gets a geras that disappears later on. And you see the complaint by Plutarch in an essay entitled Table Talk. He complains that ever since luxury has crept in, the custom of equal share for O in a feast, isomoiria, a key term, was abandoned. However, he continues that in public and traditional rituals, equality is still preserved. Quote, even now at sacrifices and public banquets, each guest is still served as equal portion of the meal. Now, when I was doing work on this project, I found myself turning to very different sections of the library at my university, or even going to another library altogether, such as the library of law, to understand inheritance or property law, or I had to go to the religious section to understand sacrifice, or to Kendrick Pitchett's work to understand the practices of war, when you, I wanted to understand booty, oracles, Greek religion again, Cleroyan colonies, historians deal with it, mostly archaeologists do. But no, there... <laughs> All these reflect on each other. All these belong to the same mindset. We find the same terminology used in all of the above, and they're simply not being put together to understand their mutual reflection and significance. They're all subsets of the same notion. When Greeks were dying, and every Greek died at some point, uh, they faced the question of inheritance. Inheritance with no primogeniture, namely inheritance, partible inheritance by lot. And that type of distribution by lot is ubiquitous. We find it in various Greek communities, Dorians, Ionians, Aeolians, in the West and the East. And it's amazing to see this uh, dynamics um, uh, that uh, exists there. Now, basically, partible inheritance by lot is, 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 a, is a community thing, tiny community, two brothers, three brothers, perhaps even more, but it's like a fractal of the entire community or the entire polis. Why? Because the group is predefined. All of the members have shares. All are interchangeable. The authority stems from the group. The arbitrator, sometimes brothers don't agree, of course, resolve a dispute about family inheritance or Sometimes we see them resolving a civil strife. 
we observe no recognized innate hierarchy. All group members, therefore, are interchangeable. I found, uh, because I never studied inheritance before, I did a lot of work on Greek colonization, suddenly I found the remarkable overlap between the two. Both concern land, both concern the kleros, whether at home or abroad. And this is a schematic uh, uh, notion, like uh, why is it worthwhile for one brother to go abroad? Namely, if you stay at home, you get half, your, half a kleros. If you go abroad, one brother gets a whole one, and the other brother gets a whole one. But who goes abroad and who stays home? That is also determined by lot. Not always, but we have some examples of that. So you see how those things merge together and should be studied together. Uh, that's what I think. And if you look at the scale of Greek colonization, back to that map again, it's, it's really huge. And the scheme of how to found a colony is consistent in historical accounts, in quasi-historical accounts, like uh, say like Kogos and Sparta, distributing 9,000 equal kleroi to the homoioi. That's why they are homoioi, because they have those equal kleroi. And, and legendary. So the limits of the imagination are also significant for an historian. What can you not imagine when a Roman Claudius got to Rome, he got 25 yugera, his followers got bina yugera, two yugera each. That was, that was self-evident for a Roman, but not for a Greek. Founders of Greek colonies, I studied that in the first book, their posterity is never heard of again. I exaggerate a bit, but basically, there's no special status to the founding people. The land is treated as eremos chora, empty which is therefore divided and split into protoikleroi, the first lots. These have a special status. Otherwise, colonies could buy and purchase land or, or conquer more land. There was not, they were not communists. You know, the idea was not absolute equality, but this is the precondition. This is the beginning of drawing lots uh, and getting the protoikleroi. You note that there are no blood aristocracies in colonies. Uh, later on, the Megara Hiblaya starts equally, but later on, the Samigarians are the fat ones, the Pachis, um, the wearers of the purple in Akragas, uh, the Gamoro in Syracuse. All that terminology in and of itself is not uh, blue blood related at all. So egalitarianism is expressed in the Protoikleroi, as I said, and just to illustrate the rather well-known uh, drawing by Beaton Mertens by now. This is Megara Hiblaya, where the median line of the block is precisely equal and to both sides facing each street. The blocks are exactly equal, not the houses, which illustrates again no absolute equality. That is no point in arguing against that because that was never there. On the other hand, the notion of equality and equal lots is quite significant, and recent findings more from uh, Himera and other places seem to confirm all of this. So this is a pan-Hellenic phenomenon. Let's not forget that uh, Greek city-states couldn't produce thousands and thousands of settlers. Miletus founded dozens of colonies. Where were the people? The answer is an organized nucleus with an oikistes, a founder, a set of nomima, such as a set of sacred calendar, for example, in terms of magistracies, division into tribes, and everybody else who comes, even the misery of all the Greeks that, Ari, that Archilochus complains about in the seventh century, need to co-opt, and within one generation, they all become uh, Americans, Americans would say, or uh, Greek, through some kind of a sieve or a melting pot, as it were. And therefore, you find this notion uh, all over the place. And finally, when you reach 508 BCE, when Claestinus the Athenian reshuffles the Athenian deck, divides the Athenians into 10 tribes, each tribe composed, I won't go into the complexity of the reform, of course, but the point is that it was complex. And it was complex through the drawing of lots. In one fell swoop, he cut through the Gordian knots of all the local affiliations, local dependencies, patron-client relationships, and so on and so forth, and to create a more cohesive uh, Athenian political community. And so 
when I hear political scientists today, and there are some of those, there are even foundations, the Sortition Foundation in Great Britain, I don't know if you heard of it, recommending to reintroduce the drawing of lots to modern democracies, they seem to treat it as a kind of a mechanism, and that's it. But the point to remember is that we are moving from isomoiria to isonomia, to equal portions of concrete portions to equal portions of abstract portions, namely that of the law. And if we do not adopt the values, perhaps the mindset, and some of the practices, and just treat it as a mechanism, the application to modern democracies that do need that remedy. Let's remember and end with a famous quote by Herodotus that the rule of the people has in the first place the loveliest name of all, isonomia. It determines offices by lot and holds power accountable and conducts all deliberating publicly. Thank you very much. Κύριε συνάδελφε, σα ευχαριστούμε πολύ για την τόσο ενδιαφέρουσα ομιλία σα και η έκφραση ενδιαφέρουσα δεν είναι ρητορικό τόπο στη συγκεκριμένη περίπτωση. Είναι από τι καλύτερε ομιλίε που έχω ακούσει σε, αυτό το, σε αυτή την αίθουσα. Η Ακαδημία Αθηνών σα καλωσορίζει με ιδιαίτερη τιμή και σα απευθύνει θερμές ευχέ για την επιτυχή συνέχιση του έργου σα. Λύεται η συνεδρία.